I got myself a Raspberry Pi 4. This is the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B 2GB edition and it's, it's definitely the fastest Raspberry Pi ever. But if you've been following the launch, you'll know that it's not been the smoothest of rides. There are issues with the CPU throttling and overheating. There are issues with the USB-C port because it's been misconfigured. You know, I actually don't care about any of those things because all I care about is the 4K HDMI output to drive this 4K TV, which will become my digital dashboard. Let me demonstrate. This thing will end up sitting on the wall in portrait mode. Something like, like this. There goes the pie. And it will be calendar, world time, weather, to do, all that sort of thing, just on the wall. Uh, but it's heavy. So yeah, that is all that I care about with the Raspberry Pi 4. But since I have it here and since the Pi 4 will probably become the new go-to board for running Octoprint, um, I thought, well, why not put it through its paces and test how hot it gets, how much faster it actually is. And I've already done the test and I can tell you with confidence, this thing is an absolute beast. Now, even though I'm not gonna be making use of it, I am genuinely excited about the Raspberry Pi 4 performance because it is actually really good. Now, if you look at why it is so much faster, let's kind of compare it to the other boards that I've done the testing with. So the first one is the original Raspberry Pi. This is the Raspberry Pi 1 Model B. It has a single core 700 megahertz ARM 11 architecture CPU, uh, 256 gigs of RAM, wait, wait megs. 256 megabytes of RAM, which is not a lot, but you know, at the time, people were happy using it. It was cheap and that was the, the main point. But whenever I bring this thing out, it is pretty obvious that it is really slow. It is too slow to be usable. This is the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B. This has four cores of the more modern ARM A53 architecture, uh, clocked at 1.2 gigahertz. And if we're really honest, the different architecture makes way more of a difference than any extra clock speed could make. Even if you overclock the Raspberry Pi 1 to a gigahertz, which is kind of the max that you can put it at, it's still not fast, it's still really slow. And that is actually the clock speed that the Raspberry Pi Zero is running at. This is basically the same board in a different form factor. So if you're looking at the Raspberry Pi Zero, um, you can take the benchmark results from this one kind of as a reference. You know, it's slightly faster, but not by much. And lastly, the Raspberry Pi 4 has four cores clocked at 1.5 gigahertz. They're the modern ARM Cortex-A72 architecture. And that again is a huge boost over the 53, A53 architecture of the Raspberry Pi 3. And this one also has two gigs of RAM. I would have probably ordered the one gigabyte version since that's probably enough for what I'm using it for. But you know, just to keep that in mind, this is two gigs, this is one gigabyte of RAM, and the old one has point 0.25 gigabytes of RAM, 256 megabytes. So there is a bit of a difference in the hardware that these boards use, but just citing the specs, I don't think does it justice to you know how much faster these are from generation to generation. So what I did to test these were three different tests, one for performance, one for temperatures using the floor thermal camera, and one for power consumption using three different power supplies and just checking whether the one amp, 1.8 amp or 2.4 amp power supply is sufficient and just checking how how much output current you need out of your USB power supply to properly power these Pis without them throttling. So I did all this testing with the newest OctoPi image, the one that runs on the Raspberry Pi 4, fully updated as of August 8th, 2019, running off of a Kingston microSD card. This one is a UHS 1U3 card, so it's a pretty fast card. One thing that's actually really cool with the Raspberry Pi series is that you can just take one image, one install, and just move the SD card between generations, and it's still gonna boot up. I use the exact same image on the Raspberry Pi 1 as I did on the Raspberry Pi 4, no issues at all. So for the first performance test, I just checked the first thing the Raspberry Pi does, booting up, and there's already a bit of a difference between the results. I measured the time that it took until the login screen was shown, and for the Raspberry Pi 1, that took 55 seconds, the Raspberry Pi 3 took 33 seconds, and the Raspberry Pi 4 took 27 seconds. With the Raspberry Pi 3 and the 4 being so close, I think it's actually the SD card that is becoming the bottleneck here. I would say the difference between the Raspberry Pi 4 and 3 is kind of negligible here, while the Raspberry Pi 1 already took twice as long as the Raspberry Pi 4. Next up, load times for a stock OctoPrint interface uh, using my laptop on a good Wi-Fi connection. And this is measured from the moment that I hit return on the address bar 
to the Octoprint interface fully loading with all its features in there. And with this one, I think the memory difference between these boards actually makes a huge difference. The Raspberry Pi 1 took 44 seconds to load up, the Raspberry Pi 3 took 11 seconds, and the Raspberry Pi 4 took just three seconds. So that was basically instantaneous. This is one of the things that you're gonna do over and over during a print job. You just open up your browser, you check on what the print is doing, or you open it up to upload stuff. So these time differences just sum up with you waiting on your device, just loading up the interface. So that is a massive difference and it multiplies over time. In case you're wondering, yes, the Raspberry Pis were all plugged into Gigabit Ethernet, just to take the Wi-Fi equation on these smaller transmitters out of the equation. So next up, a test that would take a bit longer to complete. My goal was to heat up the Raspberry Pi 4 to a point where it is maybe going to heat up and maybe throttle. So what I did is I sliced a higher polygon and modified 3D Benchy and had the Raspberry Pi or Octoprint compute how long that print was gonna do. That is just a G-code analysis that is built into Octoprint. And for this one, I just timed how long it took for that view more info panel to become available for that one G-code. So buckle up, this one's gonna be good. The Raspberry Pi 1 took 16 minutes and 29 seconds, which is long. Like you're not gonna be waiting that long before you start a print. The Raspberry Pi 3 took one minute, 28 seconds. That is a performance difference of 10X. The Raspberry Pi 3 is 10 times as fast as the Raspberry Pi 1. And then lastly, the Raspberry Pi 4 took 23 seconds. That is another 3X performance improvement over the Raspberry Pi 3. Again, it's a more modern CPU architecture, it's clocked faster, and the extra RAM may also have helped quite a bit here, um, also between each of these generations. And lastly, for performance, I checked how much CPU load I was seeing on each of these while it was printing, while it was actively streaming G-code to Prusa i3 Mark III. And if the load was too high, it would mean that not only would your interface be loading slower while the board was using CPU resources to actually stream G-code, but the worst case would be the CPU just not being able to keep up at all and slowing down the print or even getting the printer to stall because it wouldn't supply G-code lines fast enough. And for the Raspberry Pi 1, I was constantly seeing loads between 70 and 85%, which is, you know, on the upper limit. This is an uncomfortable amount of load and I'm thinking this is actually fully pegged. There's something else going on that doesn't allow it to use more CPU resources, but this thing is just completely busy with streaming G-code. So besides the load times, this is not a good choice for running Octoprint. The Raspberry Pi 3 was a lot better. It was between 15 and 30% on a single core. So it still had the other three cores available to do the web interface and system services and all that. But even on that one core, I only ever saw 30%. So I'm wondering if this thing even clocked up to its full speed while it's printing. The Raspberry Pi 4, pretty similar, 10 to 30%. Again, it's not a problem for this board at all to stream G-code in real time to a printer. And we're gonna be looking at the temperatures in a second, and the temperatures do suggest that there is still a lot more headroom in this board while it's printing. So talking about temperatures, let's go check those out. The Raspberry Pi 1 is a really low power board. There are three components on here that actually generate heat. The first one is the input regulator. This is a linear regulator. This is just burning off the extra voltage from the five volt port to 3.3 volts for the CPU. Then of course the CPU itself and the ethernet chip, that one also heats up. And they, you know, no matter what you do with them, they all hover around 50 degrees or 55 if you actually put a stress test on it. But this thing doesn't really heat up at all. 50 degrees with no heatsink is fine. And this thing does definitely not need a heatsink. The Raspberry Pi 3 actually has a different input power regulator. This is a switch mode power supply. This one doesn't just waste the extra voltage that it's getting on the USB port, but it's efficiently stepping it down to supply the CPU and the ethernet chip. And this one's actually running a bit cooler when idle. It only heats up to 45 degrees when idle. When printing, it hovers around 50 degrees again. And when I'm running a four core stress test on it, it heats up to only 67 degrees on the CPU. And lastly, the Raspberry Pi 4. This one does have that metal heat spreader over the ha over the CPU, um, which the Raspberry Pi Model 3B Plus introduced. So this one is a bit harder to actually shoot with the FLIR camera because this thing is reflective. So what I did, I just grabbed a piece of black electrical tape, which has a really good emissivity for that thermal camera, and I used that to measure the CPU temps. One of the other things that that metal heat spreader introduces is better thermal conductivity, not just towards the air, but also into your finger. So a hot metal part will always feel hotter than a hot plastic part. So even if these were at the same temperature, the Pi 4 would still feel hotter to you. 
simply because that metal slug can transfer heat very efficiently into your finger, while plastic cannot. But yes, as expected, the Raspberry Pi 4 does run a good bit hotter. It runs at 62 degrees on the CPU when idle, so that's the hottest one of the bunch so far. When printing, it bumps up to 65 degrees, which is not a lot. So that low temperature increase tells us that it's not actually spending a lot of its resources on supplying G-code to the printer. But when I'm actually running a stress test on this Pi 4 on all four cores, it does heat up to 83 degrees Celsius surface temperature. And yes, it does throttle. But again, that is a synthetic load, which loads the CPU cores more than they usually would. And I've not seen throttling in real use in you know octoprint doing its thing and simulating the g-code um, it's always run at full clock speed there only when i ran the synthetic benchmark the synthetic load test uh, did it throttle down so in real life i don't think it ever will throttle unless you're running some super high-end compute load on it and if you do need that then you can always put a heatsink or a fan on it but for i think for most users you don't need a heatsink on this, it will protect itself. Now, lastly, power consumption. I was gonna use this USB test that has like a small OLED display in here, uh, telling you exactly how much power, whatever you plug in the other end right here, draws. But the problem was this, as soon as I tried to run a Raspberry Pi through this tester device, uh, it started throwing under voltage and you know not enough power through USB issues, which means that this thing has so much resistance internally that as soon as you use it, it drops the voltage too much and the Raspberry Pi doesn't get enough power. Without it, these things ran fine with the exact same configuration. So this thing not really usable, sorry. Um, so what I did instead is I used three different power supplies. These are not the exact ones that I used, but so let me safely shut down this Pi real quick so that I can show you which one I did actually use. So real simple stuff, I started with this HTC 1 amp supply, 5 volt, 1 amp, this is the one that came with the HTC Vive. Then the next step up is this 1.8 amp supply uh, from LG, this came with my phone. And then lastly, this anchor unit that still has <laughs> the LED glowing. This is a 2.4 amp power delivery unit that both has the USB-A port and the USB-C. Um, 2.4 amps on USB is kind of the same as any other like decent USB power supply. So I tried these three Raspberry Pis with different sorts of stresses on them. So the 1 amp supply only really runs the Raspberry Pi 1 fine. Um, I used a Python script based on Harlem Squirrel's uh, publication, I'll link that below, to give me feedback on what issues the Raspberry Pi reported on itself. And I also used that for the throttling and over temperatures checks that we did uh, just previously. And I'm not sure if the Raspberry Pi 1 just doesn't report those things or if it's actually fine, but I didn't have any issues running that off of the one amp supply at all. The Raspberry Pi 3 was throwing some issues right at boot when I was using just this white no name USB cable, but as soon as I switched over to this anchor, what are the power core, power something, um, this decent anchor cable, it was fine, it ran with no issues off of the one amp supply. And it's a similar story with the Raspberry Pi 4. This uses a USB-C cable, obviously. Uh, I don't even know where I got this one from, but it worked fine with the 1.8 amp supply, but with the one amp supply, it did report under voltage issues. And also, instead of letting me shut it down, it actually just hard reset, so, even with all the things that the Pi is trying to do to account for that under voltage and under power situation, a one amp supply just isn't enough, but a 1.8 amp supply is fine. I just really like using these anchor power supplies. They are 2.4 amp per port, 4.8 amp total, and that just gives you a bit of extra headroom to plug in things into the USB ports, such as webcams or 3D printers, if those are drawing power through USB. So to sum that up, all the Pis were running just fine off of a 1.8 amp supply, but only the Raspberry Pi 1 ran fine with the 1 amp, which is kind of expected. I actually didn't expect the 1.8 amp supply to do that well. I thought I needed the 2.4 for at least the Raspberry Pi 4, but you know, another thing learned. And lastly, I also wanted to check whether the Raspberry Pi 4 was actually able to run off of a USB-C power delivery power supply and a USB-C cord. So I have two different supplies here. One is the Anchor, one is my laptop supply. This is a 60 watt power delivery Huawei supply. And I know this works fine for my laptop, my phone and other things. So this is my reference. And I used a USB-C to USB-C cable, the same one that I actually charged my laptop with, which is this three meter, Chewy Tech? 
Joey Tech, Joey Tech. And the Raspberry Pi 4 was fine. On the first plugin, it booted up straight away, no issues whatsoever. It may just be that this cable is not to USB spec, but it works. It charges my laptop with full power, it charges the, or it powers the Raspberry Pi 4, it charges my phone. This thing works. Probably not to spec, probably cause some issues somewhere else, but for this, it works. Now, the other cable that I tried is this uh, USB 3 anchor cable, which is a bit thicker and probably a bit more to spec. And this one actually did not work. So I plugged it in into both of these power delivery supplies and the Raspberry Pi 4 was just doing nothing at all. So again, my thought here is that the cheaper USB cable isn't actually made properly to spec. And because this anchor cable is made to spec, it is causing issues with the improper implementation of the USB-C port on the Raspberry Pi 4. But if you're honest, how many of you are actually gonna be powering the Raspberry Pi 4 off of a USB-C power supply? What you're probably gonna be using is, that's a micro USB cable. What you're probably gonna be using is a USB-A to USB-C cable. These are the most common ones. They come with phones, they come with everything and these just all work. So, closing thoughts on the Raspberry Pi 4. Is it as buggy and as bad as some people seem to portray it? I don't think so. I think it's actually a really good board. Now, the two issues that we saw, and that are very real, which is uh, over temperature and throttling, just I've not gotten it to throttle in real applications. I've only gotten it to throttle in synthetic loads. So for you know your typical workload, it's, it's totally adequate. Now, the, the interesting thing here is that uh, this board is advertised with a 1.5 gigahertz clock speed as it's like nominal clock. What other manufacturers have started doing as in Intel, AMD, Nvidia and AMD graphics cards is they've, they've started telling you, you know, a lower base clock that's guaranteed and then started going, oh, it, but, but it turbos up to, you know, 3.6 gigahertz. Um, but it's base clock, it's guaranteed clock is way lower. And the way I see it is the Raspberry Pi 4 is doing the exact same thing. Based on how hot it is and how much power it's getting, it's dynamically adjusting its clock speed. And when all conditions are good, it can boost up to a higher clock speed. It's just, it's the same thing, just backwards. So if you actually spin it that way is in real life applications, this thing boosts up to its full 1.5 gigahertz almost always. So I have no problem with that. On the other hand, the USB-C power supply thing, don't think is much of an issue. We're all using USB-A still and with that, it works just fine. From what I've seen with these power supplies, it's actually not much more power hungry than the Raspberry Pi 3. So wherever a Raspberry Pi 3 works, the Raspberry Pi 4 will also work. Now besides all that, there are actually two things about the Raspberry Pi 4 that I wish were different, that are kind of unnecessary, I feel like, and that are annoying to me. The first one is the fact that they're using micro HDMI. They, they've got two of them, yeah, that's fine, can run two screens, but the micro HDMI port is such a fragile, puny, tiny little port. While I've tested this, I've already broken one micro HDMI cable. They're kind of disposable. You plug them in 10 times and they're broken. And that's just something I've seen with micro HDMI, not just on the Pi 4, but also on my cameras. Uh, the large HDMI port is just so much more robust. You know, if you're gonna use a smaller connector, why not go with USB-C? Like USB-C outputs the same signal as micro HDMI. So, that's kind of a bummer. And the other thing is they've downgraded the micro SD slot. This is not a clicky slot anymore. You have to actually pull out the card. On the Raspberry Pi 3, you have this nice click click slot. That is so satisfying. You click it in and then you pull it out and it's loose. With the Raspberry Pi 4, you actually have to jam it in and then pry. It's not a big deal, but it's, it's, it's a downgrade. <laughs> so it's probably a cost saving measure that saved us like 30 cents somewhere, which went to another part of the board. So. It's all good. And because I know you guys have been staring at it the entire video, let's peel off this protective film and get it over with. While I thank my patrons who are making this entire channel possible. So big thank you to Andy Fair, Brian Raker, Christopher Day, Dorian Gray, Phyllis Struder. Wait, hold on, this is a good one. Francisco Peebles, James C. Foley, Jimmy Lee, Jonathan Malin, Marcus Hans, Matthew Oswald, Mike McGee, Nathan Haste. Mmm. Olivares, Paul Arden, Robert Hornberg, Rudolf Ong, and William Devine. Those are all patrons in the shouter tier. If you want to join in as well and help keep this channel going, you can do so right here, or you can join through YouTube memberships. Both patrons and YouTube members get access to monthly exclusive live streams and more. So yeah, thank you to everyone who's already supporting the channel and thank you all for watching. I will see you all in the next one.
Hey, and I know you're probably not subscribed yet, so why not do that right now?